Hello space fans and welcome to another edition of Space Fan News. This week, a team of astronomers using instruments on board the Very Large Telescope at the European Southern Observatory, specifically the Visual Echel Spectrograph, which is also called UVIS, and the X-Shooter uh, -shooter instrument, have obtained detailed observations of a white dwarf star known as SDSS J1228 plus 1040. And they also look at the shattered remains of an asteroid in orbit around it. So what the team did was, they looked at VLT data, which spanned over 12 years, from 2003 to 2015, and they looked at this data with the idea that maybe somehow we could learn something about the fate of our own solar system by studying this particular one. So they needed to look at this over a very large time scale, the 12 years that they did, because they wanted to get it from different angles as the material moved around and as, as the years passed and looked at different features as they might have moved throughout the system. And by looking at it over this large period of time, they also were able to get the sense that this really is a disk, and they can kind of look at all the different features over the time scale as it evolved. A white dwarf star is a stellar remnant. It is formed after a star like our sun dies, or about the size of our sun. So what happens is as stars about the size of our sun exhaust their fuel, they expand into what's called a red giant. And what's left behind is this very hot, very dense core called a white dwarf star. Now, whenever I tell people how the, our sun is going to die, and I mention that it's going to expand into a red giant and engulf the orbits of Mercury, Venus, Earth, and possibly even Mars, one of the questions I always get, and reasonably so, I mean, one would want to know this, is, is anything going to survive such an event? And that is the question that this team of astronomers is trying to answer with these set of observations. So seeing this disk of material around a white dwarf star shows that it is possible for something to survive. Although it's, po although it's probable that this particular disk of material came along after the red giant stage. Now it's pretty rare for white dwarfs to have any material in orbit around them. I mean, only seven total in the entire sky have been found so far. So what the team thinks happened here is that an asteroid strayed dangerously close to the white dwarf star and broke up and formed this disk of material that's in orbit around it. Now the orbiting disk that we see around this white dwarf was formed in similar ways that we see around planets closer in our own solar system. For example, the planet Saturn. The rings around Saturn were formed in a very similar, using a very similar mechanism. However, J1228 plus 1040 is seven times smaller in diameter than the ring planet and it has a mass over 2,500 times greater than Saturn. And the team also learned that the distance between the white dwarf and the ring of material is also a lot smaller. The entire planet Saturn and its rings would fit in between the gap of the white dwarf and this material that surrounds the star. So studying white dwarf remnants like J1228 plus 1040 can help astronomers understand how star systems and exoplanet systems around other stars ultimately evolve, similar to our own sun, but it can also help astronomers forecast what might happen and help us understand the fate of our own sun as it begins to die some 7 billion years from now. And that is astronomy you can use. Next, an international team of astronomers led by the University of Cambridge and the Australian National Observatory have identified some of the oldest stars in our galaxy. And these stars could contain vital clues about the very first stars in the universe and how they died. The very first stars ever to form in the universe are really strange beasts, and they are very different from the stars that we see today. Soon after the Big Bang, the universe consisted only of hydrogen, helium, and small amounts of lithium. All of the other elements, like the oxygen we breathe and the carbon in our bodies, have been forged inside stars, or when they die, as supernovae. For decades, astronomers have been trying to figure out what the universe was like soon after the Big Bang, and understanding how the first stars and galaxies formed is crucial to this understanding. And while some astronomers are looking way far out at far galaxies and some of the most distant galaxies in the universe, other astronomers are looking a little bit closer to home in the center of our galaxy. What they are searching for are extremely metal-poor stars. These are stars with lots of hydrogen and very little else. So have you ever wondered where the center of our galaxy is? If you go outside on a clear, dark night in the summertime you, and look toward the constellation Sagittarius, you are looking toward the center of our galaxy. Now there are billions of stars in our galaxy, and these astronomers are trying to pick out the oldest among all of the billions we have. And they're also trying to understand their chemical composition and measure their movements. 
So how do you find these very ancient stars among all the other billions in the Milky Way? Well, here's what the astronomers did. Using telescopes from both Australia and Chile, they used the fact that metal-poor stars shine much bluer than all the other stars that have more metals in them. And among all the stars that they, they observed, they picked out 14,000 candidates for which they could look at using larger telescopes and point spectroscopes at them. But knowing their chemical composition wasn't enough, they also had to get their movements. They had to measure them over time. So what they found among the 14,000 candidates was that while some of the stars in there were just passing through, others of those stars had spent their entire lives in the center of the galaxy. And the computer simulation suggested that these stars may have formed in the early universe. So when the first stars in the galaxy died, they left a chemical signature on the generation of stars that were observed in this study. And what they found was they suggested that these early stars died in something known as a hypernovae. This is an explosion that is around 10 times more powerful than an ordinary supernova. So space fans, from these observations, we now know that there are very ancient stars in the center of our galaxy. These are stars as old as they come, the very first stars. Now finally, this story was suggested by a space fan Patreon supporter. Remember back in October we heard about that star, it was called KIC8462852 and it had, it was this very strange star that was found in Kepler data by citizen scientists and it had this light signature that was a little bit strange and it was noticed by many of the uh, citizen scientists and it was reported to astronomers and so when astronomers looked at it, the first thing they tried to do was come up with natural explanations for what could explain this light curve. But before I go into that, let me take a step back and sort of remind you how Kepler works. Kepler is a space telescope that was staring at one area of the sky toward the constellation Cygnus, and it stared at 160,000 stars, more or less, all at one time. And what it was designed to do was to measure tiny dips in brightness due to the planet, or a, a possible planet, moving in front of the star and the Earth. This is called the transit method of, of finding exoplanets, and it infers the existence of a of a planet by noticing that, the, that a dip in brightness has occurred. Now most of the time these tiny dips in brightness all look more or less the same, but this star, KIC 8462852, did not look like all the others. So what was up? So the first thing the researchers did was they ruled out anything strange with the star itself, which is a 12th magnitude star about 1400 light years away in the constellation of Cygnus. So there was no hint of giant star spots, no stellar oscillations, no throbbing pulsations uh, of seismic activity on the star itself. In fact, everything pointed to this star just being a regular, ordinary F-class star. So what could explain this strange light curve? Well, one of the theories was that perhaps a comet or group of comets had broken up nearby. And while this could explain some of the characteristics of the light curve that we saw, it didn't explain everything. <laughs> so someone suggested, hey, Maybe it's a, it's a partially completed Dyson Sphere. That would explain it, right? Now, if you don't know what a Dyson Sphere is, it's this sort of mega structure that was first thought about by a guy named Freeman Dyson, and he speculated that alien civilizations could build this giant sphere around a star to capture all of its energy and help power their civilization. And so it could grab all of the energy of the star and all, do all kinds of really cool Battlestar Galactica kind of things. Well, if the strange 20% aperiodic dimming of KIC 8462852 was due to some alien megastructures around the star, then it makes sense that we should be able to detect some of this using the SETI telescopes. I mean, after all, that's what they were built for, right? So after this was announced back in October, the SETI team pointed the Allen Telescope Array to the star and studied it and listened to it for two weeks. And they were looking for two distinct radio signals. One, narrowband signals of about a one hertz in width, which would be generated as a sort of, we are here, we are here, we are here, kind of signal. That's from the Horton Here's a Who, in case you didn't know. And these were for, this is assuming that a civilization wanted to announce its presence. And this is also the kind of signal that SETI was designed to look at and looks at and looks for this type of signal the most frequently whenever it's operating. Now the second kind of signal was a, what's called a broadband signal, something, much, um, something with a much wider wavelength range. And the thinking goes is, if there were astroengineering projects going on around this star, then, then the alien civilization would presumably want to service it, right? 
<laughs> well, and stretching it a little bit further, let's say whatever they were working on this Dyson sphere with happened to use rate uh, microwaves, then we would we should be able to see those telltale signs in the microwave emissions of that star. Well, what did they find? Well, SETI announced back on November 5th that while they're going to keep looking at this star, they didn't find any evidence of deliberately produced radio signals coming from it. So we'll just have to keep looking. Well, that's it for this week, Space Fans. Thank you for watching. And as always, keep looking up. Well, guys, it's great to be back to be doing Space Fan News again. I want to thank everybody who joined on Patreon to help support Space Fan News. It really helps go a long way to making this effort, making this possible. Uh, I will make sure you guys get a copy every Wednesday, a couple of days earlier than everybody else. And if I can get to 500 supporters, then I will turn off the ads for this as well. So thank you for all who's supporting, and I'll see you guys next week.